Most people test driving their next new car get it horribly wrong. Here's what you need to know to get it right. I've driven thousands of new cars over more than 20 years. I love it. It's one of the best things about this job, getting in new cars and figuring out what they're good at and what they're not so good at. Like everything else, a test drive is a game with rules. It's an essential step in choosing the right new car. There's a lot at stake too. So here's what you need to know. Before you start, make sure the car is insured. If it's not, and if you crash, and if it's your fault, you could be in for monumental financial liability. Make sure you know exactly what the insurance excess is too. Dealers often ramp the excess right up to keep the premiums low. So a mistake you make out there on the road might still cost you three, four, five grand, even though the car is technically insured. So here are the top 10 tips for getting 100% on your next test drive. The car you test drive needs to be the car you want to buy or near enough. There's no point driving, for example, a Mazda 3 SP25 GT if you really want to buy a Mazda 3 Max. It's got a different powertrain, different tyres, more fruit. The upmarket variant is going to feel a lot better. So never fall into the trap of driving the works burger and then sign off on buying the poverty pack. Don't drive the diesel, then buy the petrol either. And make sure you know which features in the car you're driving are standard and which ones are optional. This is especially important in that premium German brand where just about everything is optional. Dealers are such absolute specialists at loading up their demonstrators with all kinds of fruit. Don't assume it's all standard. Always drive on roads you know. The whole point of experiments is to control all the variables except the one you want to test. That means a strange car on strange roads is going to feel strange. But you're not going to know how much of that strangeness is attributable to the road and how much to the car. You want to assess the car so it's not ideal if you're also testing the road. Try driving on a variety of surfaces you already know. Some smooth and some choppy, whatever. See how the car performs in an environment you're already familiar with. Think about the road noise and the ride quality on those surfaces you know. Never compare your comparatively worn out car with the new one you think you want to buy. Because guess what? Compared with your old car, the new one is going to feel pretty damn good. A five-year-old whatever with 100,000 kilometres on the clock will make any new car feel beyond excellent. Your mission is not to find a new car that's better than your old car because that's too easy. They're all better. You need to find the best new car from a short list of competing new cars. So take a day out of your busy schedule, cut back and drive the short list of three or four top contenders back to back or as close as possible. Compare new cars with other new cars. That's the benchmark. Then just choose the best one. If you don't routinely drive double digits of different cars every year, give yourself time to adapt. All cars feel different. They all have subtly different controls and those controls all offer subtly different feedback when you nudge them one way or the other. If you're testing your ability to adapt to the new car, then you aren't really also testing the new car. You need to adapt to the controls and understand the features and have sufficient time to play with all the toys. You also need time to assess the comfort levels, etc. Good luck doing that in the six left turns it takes to get out of the driveway, around the block, and back. Test drives are absolutely useless if they don't last at least half an hour. Your new car needs to fit your lifestyle. It's an ugly situation if that deposit goes down and the car doesn't get up your driveway without biffing the front lip on the approach every time. 
for the next five years. Not much fun if it's two inches longer than the garage either for the next five years. Equally unpalatable if it has a two tonne tow capacity and the boat you own actually weighs two and a half tonnes. Make sure it all fits and make sure it fits neatly. Take it home and check if necessary. You'll be driving on roads you know anyway. And I swear I just heard some old bald guy say that was a pretty good idea. The car doesn't just have to fit in the garage and up the driveway, obviously. Make sure it also accommodates your lifestyle. Let's say you and the salient partner are, I don't know, dead keen golfers. If those two golf bags don't fit in the back, or the two bicycles, or the German wolfhounds, or the three baby capsules, whatever, and you buy the car, it's a disaster. Not fun if the significant other's prosthetic hip screams blue murder climbing up or down out of the shiny new car after just half an hour inside. The whole point is, cars are more than just machines that go really, really fast and don't crash. They need to accommodate you and all the things you need them to do. If in doubt, go home and check on roads you know. While you're out there, make sure you play with all the toys. Hook up the Bluetooth, make a couple of calls, confirm the voice quality inwards and outwards. Stream some tunes too. Play Celine Dion or one of those other artists they used to play to the inmates at Gitmo when they wanted more information. Play with the cruise control. Use the paddle shifters. Turn the seat heater on and get toasty. See if the voice recognition system actually recognises your voice. Ask it to fetch your slippers or something. Then tell it which radio station you really want. Sydney's 2UE 954, obviously. Use the sat-nav too. Type in B. See if you can get there from A. I always thought you could. On roads you know. Throw the car at a reverse park too and check the view from the reversing camera. The point here is the toys are all there. Play with them. Identify in particular the ones you don't like. Buying this prospective new car is a little bit like getting married. You need to love the bits you love and you need to be able to accommodate the bits you don't Otherwise, it's all over. Always use some of the test drive to sit in the passenger seat and get in the back as well. Might as well evaluate the entire stadium, right? Except in a 911 Porsche or an Audi TT. And nobody ever seriously expects anyone to ride in the back there. Being a passenger is also a great opportunity to assess ride quality and a bunch of other things that might recede into the background when your working memory is otherwise engaged driving the car. Always reset the trip meter at the start of your drive. When you return, it's going to give you some decent indication of the likely fuel consumption out there in the real world based on how you drive. Those official fuel consumption figures have been smoking crack, that's for sure. That's how it seems to me anyway. I've got a full explanation of why that is so there. So if you want to avoid all these nasty little surprises, like when the car tells you it's actually got a drinking problem about a week after the honeymoon is over, look at the real world fuel consumption just after the test drive before you get hitched to a problem drinker. Speaking of which, you're thinking... Test drive evaluation. The sales guy, well, he's thinking test drive seduction. He knows if he gets you inside that car, you are very likely to fall in lust. The sales steps that much closer, and he wants you to want that car, and he wants you to want it bad. The test drive is foreplay. He's going to get you in that car, and then he's going to make his move. It's a very short trip from test drive to the corner penthouse of Deposit Central via Lust. In fact, they're all in adjoining suburbs. So you just need a plan, right? You need to drive the full short list, three or four cars, then go home and sleep on it. That car, no matter how nice, no matter how accommodating, no matter how sexy, it's really just a thing. So take your time, it's going to wait. Unlike your significant other, that car is not gonna get upset if you get up and drive another test car tomorrow and another one the next day, it will wait patiently. It won't mind waiting a couple of days without hearing from you, even after being driven. It's not going to make 
other plans, hook up with anyone else, or otherwise move on. It's a product. You're testing it, not taking it dancing after dinner and then up to see your etchings. There's no obligation with a test drive. Whatever you do, do not fall in love with any new car. Do all of those 10 things, make a list, and try to be analytical. If you're in the market and you haven't seen my updated video on how to beat a car dealer, check it out just there. Buyers love that video and car dealers absolutely hate it for precisely the same reason. Opprobrium is the sincerest form of endorsement. If you need the right new car at the right price without going head to head with Darth Vader in a suit, visit the website autoexpert.com.au. I'm John Cadogan. Thanks for watching.